I am Tamika Jackson Dyer, and I have had one and a half abortions. Okay, so um, I had uh, a toddler at the time. Um, I was working at a really crappy job, not making enough money. Um, my child's father was um, less than helpful with her, uh, but of course, being young and wanting um, to keep my family together. We were still together, even though it was just not working. Um, I had postpartum depression really bad uh, with my first child. Um, so I was on antidepressants and in therapy at the time. Um, and I remember feeling like something was off and I was just like, no, you can't be that. Um, <laughs> and it was. Um, and I went, um, I went to the store on my break and at the end of the day, I was usually in the building by myself. I worked uh, later than everyone else. And I went cause I didn't want to take the test at home. I didn't want to risk. I was actually, um, was I, living at home? I had, I had moved back home. Um, so I didn't want to risk, you know, taking it at home or whatever. And so I took it at work and I remember going to set it behind me, you know, to wait the time and it turned before I even set it down. And I sat there for a minute and I went straight back to my desk and I called my flexible spending account and asked um, if I was able to use all the funds uh, that I had set aside immediately or did I have to wait until it was fully funded? They told me I could use all the funds. I called my girlfriend, told her I needed a ride on Saturday, and then I called and made an appointment. In Michigan, they have a 24-hour weight law, which is uh, garbage, um, but not as bad as some other places. So I had to log on to the state website, read some information about my stage of gestation. Um, you know, they show you the sketches of... Uh, how uh, far along it is and how far the, you know, what the embryo or the fetus looks like. I was very, very certain about the date of conception because like I said, we were not living together at the time. Um, and so I knew exactly when it had happened. Uh, so I was only like maybe 12 days, like my period was even, wasn't even really late, like more than a day or two. Um, and so you had to do all that and then you have to print it out um, and it's time and date stamped so that they can prove that you had this information 24 hours in advance. Um, the sticky part was, like I said, I had a toddler. I lived at home uh, with my rather religious family. Um, and so I had to, I needed a babysitter. Um, and I also did not want him to know um, because I knew what would happen um, with with my first, uh, I wasn't real thrilled about being pregnant. Um, and let me be clear, I love my daughter, I do. Uh, but that time in my life, I was not ready. I had, I'd never really wanted kids. Um, and so I definitely was not ready and I really did not want to have kids with him. Um, and so he had told on me when I found out I was pregnant with her. Uh, and so I knew I wasn't telling him nothing. Uh, until maybe, maybe afterwards I would tell him, but I was definitely not telling him ahead of time. So, um, and it was his birthday weekend. And so we had plans. We were supposed to be together as a family that weekend. Um, so I had to come up with some cover story uh, because it was easier if he had her, you know, he could spend time with her um, and I could take care of my business. So um, my girl came and got me. We went out there. Uh, I remember the wait seemed like forever. Um, and whoever I had talked to on the phone had told me not to eat. But then when I got there, they said you were supposed to eat. And so it was just like, OK. <laughs> so that was really hard because I was sitting there hungry and I got the uh, I got the twilight. I didn't want to be put to sleep. Um, and the uh, the pill. The RU486 was still fairly new then, and so I didn't trust it. I wanted to be sure, sure. I had a friend who had um, done the pills, and it was an incomplete. And so I was like, no, I don't want to have to come back. I want it to be done. 
And so um, I got the twilight. They took me uh, to a room. There was a nurse there um, who held my hand the whole time. Uh, I remember there was like uh, water running in the background. They had soft music. So I was really, you know, relaxed. Obviously, the drugs helped. Um, and I remember it being painful, but nowhere near childbirth painful. <laughs> um, and then when she told me it was over, I was just like so relieved. Uh, and then I had to go to the recovery room and there were a couple other women in there and there was one girl who was kind of crying or whatever. Um, I felt bad that I didn't feel bad, if that makes any sense. Um, but I was very certain about my, like there was no second guessing, no thoughts. It was like, this has to happen. Um, and I was so glad that I had uh, put aside that money because like I said, my job was crappy. I made no money. I would have never been able to scrounge up the $300 that I needed. I had a book where you could go and like write your thoughts or your feelings um, or kind of like a note to a future patient or whatever. Um, and some of the notes were like, you know, I feel so sad. I feel, you know, but I, I, I just didn't. And so my note was pretty much like, you know, the staff was really friendly and um, non-judgmental and uh, made me feel like, um, you know, like I was at a doctor's office, which literally it's a medical procedure. Um, and that it was the most, um, pleasant place that I never want to come again. <laughs> and so, um, I left there, uh, and then I, I knew that, um, anesthesia makes me nauseous and I hadn't eaten all day. And so by the time I got back to him uh, and, and the baby, I was feeling like crap. Uh, and so it was like, oh, my God, how am I supposed to like act normal because he doesn't know? And, and so finally, I just broke down and told him. And I was crying, not because I felt bad about what I did, but because I knew what his reaction was. And I just didn't feel like dealing with it. So it was like this whole big thing. Um, I should have never told him. He threw it up in my face for like he still. Our, my daughter is twenty, and he still tries to make. It's like you, you're a total piece of garbage. I was exactly. I did exactly what I should have done. <laughs> so, um, but it was just really. Uh, it was. I don't want to say it was easy, but it was not something that I've ever second guessed myself about. It's been eighteen years. Um, and I know that I would not be where I am now if I had not done, it. uh, if I had been stuck with two little ones, uh, in that crappy job living at home, it just, yeah, my life wouldn't be what it is now. Um, so my mom knows now she doesn't like know all the details. I mean, well, she will if she sees this, but, <laughs> um, you know, she knows. Uh, that I've had one. Um, she's still, you know, my, my mother's a, a minister. So it it's with all the layers of that. Um, you know, uh, I told my best friend at the time, um, which was hard because she was, um, I would say she, she probably considered herself uh, pro-life or whatever at the time. Um, but it's funny how life happens because she ended up needing one because of a, a, a fetus that had uh, abnormalities that were not compatible with life uh, a few years later. And um, it's amazing how people's opinions about things change when they need something. And that's why uh, the folks who are always, um, you know, screaming about how it's terrible and awful and nobody should do it. If you've never been in that situation, you really need to just mind your own uterus. And if you don't have a uterus, just shut up. <laughs> um, but my, my daughter is aware. Um, and, you know, I've always been really open uh, with all of them. I have three children, two bio, one adopted. Um, and I've always been really open uh, about everything as far as you know, reproductive health, 
you know, reproductive justice, uh, the right to bodily autonomy, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then in my work, obviously. Um, so yeah, I've had a couple of uh, young ones, like you know, nieces, little cousins, like my daughter's friends who have come to me um, because they needed help or you know wanted to know how it works or whatever. So I'm, you know, I'm, it's not a secret. It's not a secret. It's not like, you know, I'm not shout your abortion, <laughs> like the page, um, but it's not a secret. It's not something that I'm ashamed of. I'm a lactation consultant. People think that it's just all, you know, boobs and babies, but it's literally reproductive justice because access to human milk is a reproductive justice issue. Um, a lot of my clients who look like me uh, don't have um, the resources to pay for a lactation consultant or to get prenatal education about it or to have the support that they need to be successful. So, um, yeah, it's a reproductive justice issue. And it's, you know, and it's also about choice, the choice to be able to feed your baby what you want to feed them and use your body in the way that it was biologically created to work. Um, you know, so that's what I do. Um, but as far as the recovery, it was uh, fairly easy. I had to, um, <laughs> I had to fly uh, to Vegas, maybe two weeks later, it was my best friend's wedding. Um, and that was the other thing. It was like, I have to get it done right now because I want to be at the party in Vegas. And that sounds really horrible and shallow, but it is what it is. Um, because I knew I wasn't, you know, I knew I wasn't going through with it. So why be miserable and sick in Vegas if I don't have to be? Um, so yeah, it was, it was fairly easy. I did, um, I think I may have gotten a mild infection, um, just related to, uh, my, my OB said that it's sometimes they scrape a little bit too much. That was how she put it. She was like, yeah, they, they, uh, they clean house a little bit too uh, rough <laughs> sometimes. And so, um, but that was, that was really like it. You know, after having a baby, recovery is like nothing. Um, you know, and so for the folks who try to act like it's so, I know the maternal mortality rate for birth. So there is absolutely no uh, competition between the, the two um, the two things. I've had clients who I've had to walk through, um, you know, because like if you're if you're lactating uh, and you have to take medicine, you know, you need to know how that medication may react or pass through your milk or whatever. So I've had clients reach out because they were going to get the um, non-surgical abortion and they wanted to know if it was safe. Like, will it will it affect the baby that they have now? Um, and what happens a lot of times is that people have been um, falsely informed that breastfeeding is a form of birth control. It is not. I know way too many people with stair step uh, Irish twins who thought that that was true. Um, and everybody, you know, some folks, they welcome that. It's okay, great. Kids are close together. We can get it out the way. Um, and then other people are like, absolutely not. I cannot do this. Um, and so I had a client who um, her first two children were Oh my God, like maybe 11 months apart. Um, and so then there was a big gap when she had her third. They were like maybe eight, he was like eight or nine years younger than the others. And then she got pregnant again when he was, you know, only a couple months old. And she called me frantic because she's like, I cannot do that again. Like I she had horrible postpartum depression. Like it was just bad, bad, bad. And she was like, I can't do that again. Um but she was scared because she didn't know um, if it was okay, if it would affect the baby that she already had. Um, and that's what a lot of people forget about is that a lot of women who get abortions are mothers. Um, they already have children. And so they are thinking about the babies that are here, um, not these potential children, um, because the ones who are here are the ones that they have to take care of right now. Um, and folks lose sight of that a lot of times, I think. And so she was just like, I can't take care of these kids and do, I can't. 
And so, you know, I had to do, so I've done a lot of research on the, um, the medication uh, abortions and all that kind of stuff. And so it was like, yes, you can do it. Uh, you know, you might see a little dip in your supply, but, and so she went on and, and she's happy and healthy and her kids are well adjusted and all that, but she was just, you know, really um, glad to get the information and not have, you know, be all judgy or like all the fake websites that pop up when you search for stuff. Um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely something that folks don't talk about. Um, and a lot of my colleagues are like, um, some of them are, you know, the, the birthy people. I'm, I, I guess I'm considered a birth worker, uh, lactation and, and doulas and midwives and stuff like that um, are kind of like really anti. Um, but then at the same time, it may be just that they are like, you know, I couldn't do that for myself, but I would never tell anybody else because when you're in this work, you know that there are lots of situations um, that, you know, never make it into the news or in the sound bites, um, you know, that folks just have no idea uh, what life is like for real people who have to make these real decisions. Uh, and so I work with real people <laughs> all the time. I'm in the community. Um, and so I see these things. And so, um, you know, the whole every baby is a blessing. Mm, not always. Not always. Um, you know, everybody's situation is not conducive to motherhood. Um, and so it's not my place to judge what you need to do for your life to be what you need your life to be. And that is what pro-choice is. It's, you know, if you want to have a bunch of kids back to back, and <laughs> not something I would do, but that's your business. That's your body. That's your business. If you don't want any, that's your business. If you would really like to plan and space, and that's your business. So that's really like what people need to grasp. Pro-choice means exactly that. Uh, it's not just about abortion. Um, it's about the right to choose what you want to do with your body, period. Oh, goodness. So um, because sometimes we're all really stupid, I ended up uh, staying with that person. We actually ended up getting married later on. Um, bad idea. But, you know, want to make sure we have this family unit uh, coming from a, um, a good Christian family. Um, <laughs> so um, we did have another child together. It was great. It was wonderful. I finally left. Uh, it was very abusive. Um, and shortly after I left, like not even a month later, I found out I was pregnant. Um, and it was not, um, the scary part was that I had had a surgery a couple of years prior. So I only had one tooth left. I only had one tooth and one over. And I was like, really? Really? <laughs> And so, um, you know, I'm solo because he was absolutely no assistance. I got three kids um, working a better job, but still not making enough money to take care of three kids by myself. Uh, and so I'm like, OK, there, there's absolutely I'm like, something is wrong. Um, and I went uh, I actually went to the clinic to get the test this time. Because I was like, I don't even need to waste time going to the store. I'm just going to go straight there and make my appointment, whatever. Um, and it was positive. But I was too early because I know my body so well that I knew exactly when it happened. Uh, it, was a, uh, it was a coercive experience um, because I'd already moved out. Um, I had gone back to get some things and uh, we ended up having sex. I will not call it rape, but it was definitely not um, a mutually, uh, agreed upon event. I'll just say that. Um, and so I knew exactly when it had happened and it was crazy because he had a vasectomy after our youngest kid, but of course he never went back to get checked. And so I was kind of in denial a little bit, like oh, this can't be happening, but it was. And, um, I had scheduled my appointment, but something didn't feel right. 
so I went to the ER because I actually woke up and I was spotting. And I was just like, this is insane because I'm supposed to be getting the procedure today. So do I really care if I'm spotting or not? But I need to know what's going on because something just doesn't feel right. So I went to the ER and they, you know, went through the whole, you know, sent me to the pregnant floor and all that, which kind of sucked. Um, and the doctor's like, you know, oh, everything is good. Everything is fine. Your service is still closed. And I'm like, that's not really why I'm here, but <laughs> um, okay. So um, I, I, I left the ER and I went to the clinic and, um, you know, they make you take the test again. So I, I'd had the test at the ER. Then I had to test at the uh, abortion clinic and uh, you know, it was positive. Okay. So I get in the room and they go to do the ultrasound um, to try to find the sac and they don't see anything. So then they do the wand and they don't really see anything. So then they bring the doctor in and he goes to look. And this is all very invasive and very uncomfortable because, uh, um, and of course I had to, I had to had to set up childcare and all that kind of stuff to go um, and, and take care of this business this day. And then I saw the doctor's face and he said something to the nurse. He asked her something about my test. Uh, and they were like, yes, it's positive. Da, 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 da. And he told me, you need to go to the ER right now. The doctor told me to go to the ER and I told him I just came from the ER. And he's like, you need to go back because there's nothing in your uterus. And I'm like, what do you mean? It's not that I, the pregnancy test is positive. And he's like, it's in your tube. Well, I know what that means. And so now I'm scared. Um, and it's like, okay, but I just went through all this stuff at the ER and they didn't find it, but the clinic did. Um, so I was really glad I kept that appointment. So I had to go back to the ER um, and when they saw me, when the nurse saw me, she's like, oh, you're still waiting for your discharge papers. And I'm like, no, I'm back because I need to see the doctor. And so when he came in the room and he's like, oh, well, you know, are you still bleeding? I'm like, no, I need an ultrasound. Um, because I feel like something is wrong. And so he's like trying to tell me that, um, you know, cause I was like, I feel like it's in here where it's not supposed to be. And so, you know, he's trying to tell me like, you know, I had very little scar tissue from before and it's highly unlikely. And I said, unlikely is not impossible. And I've been living in this body my whole life. You are an expert, yes, but I'm an expert on my body. And so I need an ultrasound. And so he was like, okay, well, and I was like, look, this, Pregnancy is not supposed to be happening right now. And I just went to the clinic and they told me. To, and so he's like, oh, OK. So he sent me for the ultrasound. And I was right. Uh, and it wasn't just in my tube. It was in the cornula, which is the most dangerous place it can be because uh, it's right on that um, right on that artery uh, that feeds your uterus. And so a rupture could lead to bleeding out like immediately. Um, and so luckily, because I am so in tune with my body, I caught it like as soon as it happened. And so I had to go through all this stuff with these shots. And uh, um, and so technically it wasn't considered uh, an abortion because it was an ectopic pregnancy, but then there are idiots in the GOP who think that you can just move an ectopic pregnancy and re-implant it. So I'm here to say that that's not possible. <laughs> that's a medical impossibility. If it is not in the uterus, it's not viable um, and it can kill you. Um, and I did almost die because it still ended up rupturing uh, even after uh, getting the medication. And I ended up having to have emergency surgery um, because of internal bleeding, um, which means that, you know, this unplanned, uh, unwanted thing almost took me away from my, my children. Um, and that was very scary. Uh, that that recovery was rough because it was, like I said, it was. That's why I say I have one and a half. <laughs> so uh, that's that's the half, um, and that made me even more because if it wasn't for the clinic, I would have gone home and you know, oh, just rest. 
you know, you're just, you're stressed out, you know, and I might have bled to death in my sleep. Um, we are not listened to. Uh, we are four times more likely to die uh, due to pregnancy complications. So when I see black people in particular, black people period, but black men in particular, uh, spouting off about um, being anti-choice or, you know, abortion is bad. Do you even know how much more likely your woman is to die trying to give birth to a child in this country? Um, you know, they, they don't listen. They don't uh, take our pain seriously. Um, the reason why I almost died is because I knew something was wrong. I felt it. Um, we called the ambulance. I got to the hospital. It was a busy Friday night. They literally rolled me in and parked me in the corner. Uh, so I was laying in the corner, bleeding internally um, for probably close to an hour. Um, and I remember feeling, uh, because I, I had, um, I'd had one uh, weird uh, incident during that whole process with the shots and stuff where like my blood pressure dropped and I had ended up staying in the hospital overnight. Um, but I could feel my blood pressure dropping. And I was so weak, but I, I like all my strength and I called out to the nurse that was passing by. And, you know, she came, you know, she's busy. She's, and I said, my blood pressure is falling. And she's like, what? And I realized I was probably kind of whispering. And I was like, my blood pressure is dropping. And she looked at me and like her face and then everybody started running around and I'm like speeding down the hallway on the um, gurney. And I just remember uh, so many people in the room and they had me hooked up to the machine and my blood pressure was 70 over 34 and falling. Uh, and if you're not in, in you know, healthcare, you might not understand. That means I was dying. That, that's what that means. That means I was dying um, and I was watching the machines and I was very clear on what it meant. Um, and they were like panicking and there were IVs everywhere. And um, yeah, it was uh, very scary. And the fact that I had laid there in the corner for an hour, just bleeding because, you know, I was just complaining of abdominal pain um, and yeah. But I, I know way too many families that have lost people, uh, have lost mothers, sisters, cousins, friends, daughters, uh, because they do not listen to us. They don't believe our pain. They don't believe we're in pain um, because, you know, the myth that Black people don't feel pain, which is deeply rooted in slavery and all the foolishness that this country was founded on. Um, so, yeah, it's... it's uh, making sure that folks know their bodies, that they know how to advocate for themselves, that when something is not right, um, you know, if you have to go to somebody else, which you shouldn't have to, but if you have to go to somebody else, go to somebody else because the doctors are experts, but they're not experts on your body. You are the expert on your body. You lived in it your whole life. Um, <laughs> so nobody knows your body better than you do. Um, and that's, why it's so important to have full bodily autonomy and be able to do what is best for your body. The funniest part is that um, nobody really knows, um, like, of course, obviously everybody knew I was in the hospital, um, but nobody really knows why I was there. They thought, um, I remember waking up after surgery and telling my nurse, cause she's like, oh, people have been waiting for you. Um, and I remember telling her, you cannot tell them why I'm here. Like you cannot tell them what I was here for uh, because of course nobody knew I was pregnant. No, cause technically I wasn't cause the next topic is not, but um, well, 
anyway, um, but, like nobody knew I was pregnant. I didn't want anybody to know because like I said, I had just left and it was this horrible, messy situation. Um, and that was like the first thought on my mind. Like, do not tell. Like, I know my mother and I'm right here. You cannot tell them. And she's like, oh, no, nobody's going. I'm like, my mother's an Aryan. Um, so I need to make sure like my chart is nowhere that she can see it because she'll know, you know what the different things mean and what it says. Um, and so uh, most people thought it was um, like a rupture, like an ovarian cyst rupture, because I had had surgery for that before. Um, so they thought maybe the other one had ruptured um, because my previous surgery, I caught it like right before uh, the ovary exploded, basically. Um, so it was easy to just, you know, say that that's what it was. And it kind of sucked that I couldn't like tell the truth about what it was because I almost died. And I was still worried about people judging me um, about the thing that almost killed me. Um, so that was... That was kind of stressful, um, especially because I had to, you know, the follow ups uh, with my doctor and everything, um, making sure that whoever took me to my appointments, just because, of course, this was before the pandemic. So, no, I don't need anybody to come into the room with me. I don't I don't need uh, uh, anybody being around for this. Um, but it was very clear to me that. Uh, the clinic was vital to me still being here uh, because the mainstream, you know, the hospital, the doctors, they, they weren't listening. Um, and I knew something was very wrong. Um, and so that definitely confirmed that because um, I've, I've been pro-choice was a concept that I have embraced probably since I was like nine or 10 years old. Um, and so that definitely solidified it for me, that, um, that experience. I didn't want anybody to know that I had still had sex with that man um, because I left, left. Um, packed up the kids, a couple bags of clothes, left. Um, and I knew because it wasn't like we live in such a, um, rape culture is so accepted, um, that like I said, I still don't even call it, even though I know probably I could classify it as a sexual assault. Um, I still don't call it that for myself because it's like, well, you know, he could be violent, which was one of the reasons why I left, but he wasn't violent that day. You know, like he didn't threaten me with a gun or anything like that. So it's like, I know, I knew I would be judged. Um, like, oh, you know, you said you were done. Well, I am done. I'm I'm not trying to be back with him. Like this was uh, a horrible, horrible, horrible fluke that ended up being even worse. Um <laughs> after the fact. Um, but yeah, I definitely, there was no way uh, that I could, no, there was no way I could tell them. I did have one uh, physician friend that I reached out to, um, to ask about like the drug that they were giving me. Um, you know, like if she knew of any side effects or, you know, anything I should be worried about. Um, but no, nobody knew. Nobody knew. Um, very few. Uh, my current husband, um, he he knows. I've known him since I was in the eighth grade. So, um, you know, he was aware after the fact. Um, but no, I really didn't tell anyone. If someone trusts you enough, to share their story with you, honor that. Don't, um, because I think about the fact that my friend who took me to the clinic is a good Catholic girl. And she immediately, no questions asked, was like, okay, uh, what time do I need to pick you up? Um, 
So, you know, if they trust you to share that information with you, because it's not easy, um, honor that. Be that person that they obviously believe that you are. Um, you know, they don't need you trying to convince them otherwise, because it's not, um, I know it, it, in telling my story, it's like, oh yeah, she just like, bam. It was because I had already um, agonized over it with my first pregnancy that I didn't have to think about it. It was like, oh no, I'm definitely not doing this for him again. Definitely not. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not struggling. I'm, I'm barely paying uh, daycare and keeping diapers now. Like I can't. Um, and so that's why it was so easy to make the decision. Um, but it's not an easy decision. You know, people, even when it's the best decision for you, because of all of the extra baggage that comes along with it and the judgment and, the, you know, the people in the news and the, there's a clinic down the street from my house and they're like out there every weekend with their little signs. And it's like, but how many foster children do you take? How many kids have you uh, you know, helped feed? How many mothers are you making sure their medical bills are paid or paying her rent after she gets laid off because she can't do her job while she's pregnant? Like, go sit down somewhere. <laughs> so it's just, um, it just irritates me so much. Uh, you know, put your money where your mouth is. Yes. Okay. I had an abortion, but I also raised a child that I did not birth. I've done both. Um, so it's, um, really maddening for folks who have absolutely no idea what it's like to have to make the decision to make light of it or to act like it's just, you know, so easy. Um, you know, there are some folks, like I said, who are like, okay, this wasn't what I planned, but this is what I'm going to do now. Okay. And that is their choice. And that's the whole point. It should be your choice. Um, because there are way too many uh, kids here who are here because their mothers felt like they didn't have a choice, uh, who are not being taken care of well, uh, who are tossed away or neglected or because, you know, I have friends who work for CPS. I'm a mandated reporter. I see all kinds of stuff. Um, so all these people who are out here getting their sound bites in about all oh, children are a blessing and everything. Every life has purpose. Yeah, okay. Okay. I need you to come down here and sit in the courtroom where they're hearing the cases for Child Protective Services and tell me that when you get done. I need you to go ahead and say, yes, I will be a foster parent to these children who don't have anywhere to go. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll babysit those kids while this mom who is a dancer goes and works her 10 hour shift or the mom who is on the line at the factory works her uh, doubles three, four days in a row because now she has an extra mouth to feed, but she doesn't have enough money to pay for childcare. Do that instead of picking it up and down in front of a clinic uh, harassing people. Um, so I breastfed my firstborn, um, and it was an excellent, wonderful experience. And I was like, everybody should do this. And so, um, I was really like just an advocate. Uh, but then when I had my youngest, I had a lot of issues <laughs> uh, and he was actually planned. He's the only pregnancy that I've ever had that was planned. Um, and everything went wrong. Like I was in and out the hospital the whole time with him, um, lots of complications and so breastfeeding was no different. And I actually had to um, go see a lactation consultant. Um, and she was just amazing because when you're struggling, an LC is like magic. Um, and so I was like, I'm going to do that. And so I uh, got into the field as a peer counselor um, and then decided I wanted to go further because there aren't very many IBCLCs of color. Um, International Board Certified Lactation Consultant. There's not a lot of us. Uh, when I first started here in Michigan, there were two that I knew of uh, in the whole state. Uh, now there's about around 20 of us. Um, but uh, it also allowed me to do all of the things that I love to do in one job. 
So like I used to think I wanted to be a lawyer. Um, and so I was actually in school. I was in, in, you know, taking law classes, decided I really didn't like that that much. Um, but I do like advocating for people. So I was like, OK, so what can I do that lets me do that? And then I like to teach. And I don't want to be a teacher, not interested in being a teacher. Uh, my grandmother is a retired educator. Um, you know, and she always said that I needed to teach like I should teach. And I'm like, yeah, I don't want to be a teacher. And I actually did something for a minute. Um, but that was not where I wanted to be. But in this job, uh, I get to advocate for folks. I get to educate people. Um, I get to speak. I've, I've been doing public speaking since I was like two years old. <laughs> so I get to do all of the things that I love to do. One job. And um, it's empowering. I get to empower uh, women about their bodies. Because it's so much that we don't know that we're not taught our school system is garbage. Um, and there's people like literally don't even know how their bodies work. And so being able to teach someone about this amazing thing that they can do for themselves and their baby um, that can literally help people. Like if you can't afford uh, to buy milk or food for your baby, you don't have to. This is free and it's accessible to you. Um, and it helps make you and the baby healthier and, and, and. So it's like all these things um, because the money pressure when you have a new baby is, you know, it's a lot. And so, um, and then also like for me being a domestic violence survivor, I know that sometimes um, you're scared to leave because it's like, uh, I've had clients who are like, well, but you know, he, you know, he, I won't be able to feed the baby. Like I won't have money. You don't have to worry about that. You know, if nobody else is eating, the baby can eat if you breastfeed. <laughs> so that's one less thing to worry about where you can literally just pack up the diaper bag and run if you have to, um, because you know that your baby will be okay. So it's just a lot of things built into it that people don't think about. It's not just boobs and babies and latching and, you know, it's reproductive justice and it's, uh, bodily autonomy and it's um, the freedom to make choices about um, what, what you put into your children's bodies and just all of those types of things. So um, I love what I do. Um, I love what I do. I've been in the field officially for about 12 years now. Um, you know, I have a private practice. Um, my day job is really, ma'am. Really, and and she decides she wants to be on camera because I put the other one away. Um, <laughs> it's, um, you know, my day job is more administrative, but I still have my private practice where I get to see uh, clients, um, and then um, I work with a team so that we're able to provide services to those who wouldn't normally be able to afford it. So I get to do all the things that I love, um, and and make money. So you know, that's a, a super win. <laughs> Do what is best for you, not what your boyfriend or your husband or your partner wants. They're not the ones that are going to have to go through the process of the body changes and the life changes and the, uh, you know, the pushing out or the being cut open. Um, you know, not what your mama says you should do, not what your friends think you should do. Don't face a life changing decision because babies grow up they're they're yeah they're real cute mm -hmm. when they first get here but um like I used to tell folks all the time <laughs> when they would ask when you know when are y'all gonna have a baby with my uh with my ex uh, you know oh your babies would be so pretty pretty babies shouldn't cry too um and so just because it's a pretty baby doesn't mean that it's going to be, they're not baby dials. They're, they're actual whole human beings that you are completely and totally responsible for. So if you are not ready for that, um, not to have a baby, but to be responsible for a human being <laughs> that you have to feed and clothe and shelter and educate and and make sure that they are healthy and become well-rounded citizens and um, that they grow up and then they won't be cute anymore sometimes. 
teenagers are not fun. Um, <laughs> and that, um, and that you will be attached to this other person for the rest of your life. It's not 18 years for the rest of your life because eventually grandchildren come. So you will be attached to this person for the rest of your life. Is that something that you think you can do? Um, and if the answer is an overwhelming no, if you know um, that that's not something you want to or can do, then don't do it. Um, because I know way too many folks with, with, with guilt babies. Um, you know, I know a girl who, and this sounds absolutely horrible, but every time I think about it, I'm just like, she is literally a mother because the clinic would not take checks. And the state that we were in at the time, um, I wasn't living here, uh, their laws, um, she got paid, I think the next day or in two days, it might've been like a Wednesday and she got paid on Friday. Um, and she needed to be able to float a check. This was before, you know, everything was digital and automatic and they wouldn't take checks. And if she waited until payday, it would be too late uh, time-wise legally. So she has a child because the clinic wouldn't take checks. That's just, mm. so if it's not something that you know you can do and be fully, because being a parent is not easy, even when you have help, even when you have help, it's not easy. Um, and again, childbirth can be deadly especially for black and brown women. So if it's not something that you are willing, that you think you can do, then don't do it. Um, and find, find somebody you can talk to, even if it's just the counselor at the clinic, um, to make sure that you are doing what you want to do. The t-shirt is from Birth Nerds. You can find her on Instagram. Um, she does a lot of lactation and birth related t-shirts, but this one right here is one of my favorites. Um, always get lots of interesting looks when I wear it. <laughs> but it is true, abortion is essential healthcare. Um, and so that's a message that I stand behind wholly. Um, support local black owned women businesses. So check her out on Instagram, The Birth Nerds. That's all I wanted to say. I needed to put a plug in. <laughs> <laughs>